Yeah, and thank you very much for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone to the webinar on future of health. Um, a webinar and in, within a in context of like 40, 45 minutes can only cover uh, you know, course aspect. So uh, I hope that we will be able to continue that and dive more into the depth. In this uh, presentation, I want to be, I want to use it as an awake session, awake you to the technologies that are available right now that will come up and that will possibly change the delivery of healthcare dramatically. And aware uh, to, uh, to an extent that I would like you to realize what is uh, currently going on in healthcare what is currently going on on a global level, and obviously with the crisis of COVID-19, uh, how do we deal with these things in the future, maybe using technologies? I, I think some of the aspects I, I discuss, particularly tele-diagnostic, tele-consulting, are actually very relevant uh, uh, at the moment and will become more relevant in the future. Actually, this is a very nice um, uh, first uh, a picture I, I uh, show here um, on the left. It's uh, almost 100 years old from a German clinician, uh, you know, where he was thinking about what would the doc futures uh, of the doctor look like. And here is he's actually dressed in a, in a suit, so not in a, in a white gown. And he's remotely uh, looking uh, at a dashboard monitoring patients. This is almost a, 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 uh, a first implementation or a realization, potential future realization of a monitoring, telemonitoring device. And um, I think uh, doctors already were uh, are very interested in the future are interested in what will happen to the to healthcare delivery and we all should be he was also uh, writing a book about the human as an industrial palace or basically a machinery um, I think there is some criticism on this one because it's it, it basically says that we are all the same and we are not we are uh, you know very unique individuals that also need unique treatments and uh, so statistics is to a certain extent valid for for uh, uh, treatments, but uh, it, it also is sometimes deceiving. So um, also companies, this is a very nice uh, uh, drawing or uh, illustration from a very huge German uh, medical technology company, uh, where they were kind of like playing out what will happen, you know, in a disaster scenario, also very relevant to right now. And why are they doing these kind of things? Because they want to know what is needed in the future uh, and also what uh, what they should work on uh, at the moment to be up to date with future developments. So, uh, you know, companies, people, everybody deals with the future. Everybody tries to think about the future. And I think it's very important to actually project, um, you know, future potential future developments uh, down to the presence and see what you have to work on right now to intercept uh, the, the actual developments. Um, so I stole this one here from Singularity University. It's, a, it's, a start, it's basically the cone of future. I, I, I like this very much because it shows plausible future, probable future, possible future, and it also highlights preferred future. What is the future that we actually like to do, uh, like to have? And, and I, that's actually a question I ask my students all the time is, Yes, you can accept the future that a Jeff Bezos or, uh, or an Elon Musk gives you. Nothing wrong with their future, possibly, but maybe it's not what I want. And uh, if you really would like to live in the future scenario uh, that you would like to see, then you have to work on it. You cannot necessarily be always a follower, but you have to be a determiner as well. So determine the future yourself. So that's also a reason why um, I wanted to do this, uh, this webinar. So uh, on the other hand, I have to say I'm one of the, uh, one of the presenters and, and uh, one of the one who tries to tell you what the future will look like, but I, I don't really know what's gonna happen and uh, nobody really does. So we can only uh, estimate and, and anticipate certain things looking at uh, current technologies out there and also looking at needs. Uh, because they will certainly intercept uh, technologies of future development with needs. And um, this is something that you obviously know anyway and follow anyway, but uh, be somebody who anticipates rather than somebody who reacts and follows. So um, I may not have given credit um, to all uh, to all people that I took uh, information from for this uh, for this presentation, so here are some of them, some of the uh, um, some of the platforms, some of the uh, institutions that I follow, that I like, that I appreciate, and um, I already uh, again apologize if I should have not given proper credit to uh, everybody.
So what are the learning goals? I, first of all, I, I want to make clear to you that, uh, you know, healthcare is not bad at the moment. In certain areas, certain countries, you see that the COVID-19 crisis is actually showing things they did not expect not enough emergency rooms, maybe not very well prepared, maybe too much looking onto the cost side rather than on the on the on the need side, and uh, there's a lot of unresolved issues that you that we see you know significantly more right now, and we also see that there's huge inequalities, and uh, with that a lot of future challenges for for healthcare. So uh, some of the goals that we that we need to uh, have in future developments for health are that we improve the uh, experience for both the clinician and the patient, and we create better outcomes, obviously, uh, and greatly reduce cost. Cost is a major issue and uh, very often not taken uh, uh, into consideration for new developments. Um, at, also at universities and research, you know, we like to do things that are complex, complicated, um, and, but we don't really look at making things easier. Um, so also I would like you to uh, have a little bit of an idea what new technologies will actually bring on healthcare delivery, what the effects will be, and uh, also question whether um, it is worth or is, is a good idea to continue focusing uh, on these complex expensive systems and, and not taking technology to actually reduce complexity, make things easier, take things out of the system rather than always putting things in. Um, and uh, I'd like to also talk a little bit about the uh, exponential technologies in depth and uh, what future entrepreneurial activities will be with respect uh, to these developments. What kind of opportunities are there? So what is innovation? Uh, and uh, I was a little too quick uh, pushing this down. Innovation is invention times commercialization. It's the only formula we'll see in this presentation. Um, th there's a lot of inventions. I'm, I'm from the university. I, um, I, I do a lot of new things and uh, we always like to be inventive, but we don't really think about too much about how we will actually commercialize these things. And only if a patient, if, if, a, if a system, a new device actually sees a patient, it is an innovation. Uh, other, than, other than that, it's only an invention. It will, it will basically be stuck around, will be a journal paper, maybe some people will read it, but at the end of the day, it will not create a value. So please, uh, also to all the researchers, uh, my fellow researchers, look a little bit into the commercialization. Try to understand uh, what is really needed out there rather than uh, always coming up with uh, great new stuff uh, that at the end of the day, nobody needs. So I also would like to have a quick definition of incremental versus disruptive innovation. Um, incremental, something where basically you do something marginally better than before, you improve things and uh, Best example for me is always using a car. You know, the next generation car will always use less gas and have more uh, more horsepower and probably be a little more comfortable and looks a little more aerodynamic. But this is an incremental improvement. You will reduce cost, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and disruptive is something where you try to actually implement a new technology. You, you th completely think from scratch and uh, with dramatically reduced cost, but you know, a similar performance. Um, and this is a, a disruption process that is, is dramatically more uh, challenging and also risky, you know, risky for the developer and for the researcher, because it doesn't really know the outcome, but also has a dramatically better uh, benefits for the society. A another way of looking at it is actually that uh, disruption is always something that, um, that can reduce cost increase number of patient engagements, reduce uh, manufacturing costs, not by 10%, but by a factor of 10, a factor of 100, a factor of 1,000 maybe. Um, to have this kind of thinking process, you cannot use what's out there already. You need to start from scratch. And if you see that with respect to medicine, um, there's a lot of people who think about uh, improving traditional medicine. This is incremental innovation rather than coming up with completely new ways of doing uh, healthcare treatment, healthcare delivery, and new medicine. Something that is intrinsically difficult in that system because people have learned for a long time in, 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 in that context, and they like to do what they have learned for a long time rather than 
uh, completely rethinking their workflow and their delivery processes. So um, if you really look at uh, what happened in the past uh, with respect to making traditional medicine better, or incremental innovation, it has not really uh, uh, reduced cost and has not proven to dramatically improve healthcare on a global level. So we need to think a little bit more uh, disruptive. Uh, one of the examples I always lose, piece apologies to uh, to uh, Brigham Women's Hospital where this is installed, is the Amigo Suite. Very complex setup. Uh, it's basically non plus ultra, the 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 ultimate scenario uh, of a of a surgical room where you have a three Tesla MRI, a PET CT, a very advanced surgery room. Question that you have to ask yourself is, yeah, it's really really cool. It's a great technology, but who does it benefit? Will it be uh, will it be something that is available for everyone in the world, or will it only be something for very few cases, for very particular cases, and only be uh, available to a small uh, um, small portion of the society? This is cool to have, but it's not solving our problems. Um, same thing, I, I, I uh, um, apologies to the company that I used here, um, uh, Care Syntax, a uh, very nice company. I, I, I um, uh, appreciate their CEO very much and their, their chairman. So, But they have used disruptive technologies, or the, the, the word disruptive in context with the 2020 surgery trends. And what they did is actually used uh, AI, machine learning, robotics, uh, augmented reality, uh, other new, new digital technologies in the context of surgery but is that really disruptive what it does it as actually makes existing technology better yes good and we need to do that but please think also that these kind of approaches add technologies make things a little bit better maybe 25 percent maybe even more but they also make it dramatically more expensive so is that the right balance should we maintain that and are we sure that that will help you know people in africa and uh, uh people in areas with no access to uh, advanced healthcare. So I don't want to blame the big companies, but they have a business model that uh, is not, you know, trying to get disruption into the market because that also means a uh, dramatic lower revenue and a completely changed business model. So no blame for them. But I think that entrepreneurs will need to solve the global challenges. And in that context, I need to think about also the distinct needs of uh, other countries, other economies. I mentioned Africa a lot of times, but maybe also think about something called reverse innovation, where you develop something for a for an emerging market because it's difficult to implement that in an established healthcare system. Try to prove a point there, and when it's turns out to be good, then it actually goes back to the uh, developed world because it already has proven a point. So reverse innovation is, is something that I believe we should teach and do much more often. So will the future look like this? Possibly. The, the question you should ask is, do you want the future to look like that? And if the question is, there's some empathy involved, you have trust in the system, it's better. Um, yeah, why not? Why shouldn't it look like that? Um, but at the end of the day, um, we uh, need to first, before we discuss what it will look like, discuss what are the problems, but problems with the healthcare. Um, and every conference I go to, I hear that healthcare will change dramatically. But most of the times, people don't present me with facts. So what kind of change is really needed? And also, what does it mean? And I'm, I'm very much into innovation, entrepreneurship, and also as a, as, a, as a university professor, also interested in education. What does it mean for education? Are we up to speed on education? So I think we can agree that we need to do more digitization. We need to do more data exchange. Everything that we do in healthcare needs to be connected. Uh, I think there's no disagreement on that. Well, we are quite away from that. There's a lot of uh, ideas behind it, but we are, we are not there yet. Does it look like that, that we have an independent robot? Yeah, people are working on it, uh, surgery. Uh, but surgery is an, is, is an outcome where you already have a disease that needs to be fixed. But I, I would like to also in this presentation highlight some aspects where we try to avoid um, things from happening. So um, there's uh, drawings about future hospitals that will combine all these things. That's all nice and hopefully will happen that we have all these things, but we are, we are far away from that. We are actually in, um, uh, in, in 1970s terms, uh, 1980s terms with respect to technology uh, used in hospitals. We are far away from the fourth industrial revolution where we use artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, 
only on occasional levels, only in research setup, but not in wide use. So we need to catch up in healthcare. And one of the reasons why we can't catch up, and, and there's also good, that's, that's also a good reason, is we're dealing with humans. We're dealing with, with, with you and me, and we don't want things to happen uh, to us that are unproven, that are probably don't turn out right, that uh, uh, create the, the false and the wrong input. So regulation and, and safety are certainly aspects that stop us from implementing faster. So healthcare in, in essence does not like disruption. That also has to do with the amount of training it takes for people that are active in the healthcare system to learn what they are supposed to do. And uh, it's, it's pretty nimble. It's, it's, it's really down at the bottom. It, it doesn't like change. And on the other hand, healthcare is not really healthcare. It's, it's somewhat of a sick care system. You don't go to a doctor if you're healthy. You go there when you're sick. You are surrounded by sick people when you're in the waiting room. You go to the hospital to get treated when you're sick. The health insurance pays in case you're sick. A life insurance pays in case you die. Why not in case you live? So it's all kind of like set up for the negative rather than for the positive. We need to turn this around into a really healthcare system where the focus is on maintaining the health rather than treating when you're sick. So a little chart I use in that in that context. It's uh, it's a chart that is, it's it's the uh, the health adjusted life expectancy, which is actually the 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 subtraction of life expectancy minus the time that is less than perfect uh, health. And if you look at uh, there's two two distinct uh, charts on the on the on uh, two distinct arrows here. There's one. This is like the developed world. The Germany is the UK is the US, and then there is these uh, leapfrog countries. And if you just look at these, the two countries out of the out of the uh, high income world, the U.S. and 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 UK. I use UK because Germany didn't turn out to be that good in that respect. But UK, you know, everybody complains about the UK system, a healthcare system. But what it does, it is relatively inexpensive. It's it's actually less than half of what the U.S. costs, but it actually pro provides a better outcome. So um, in that same context, look at the leapfrog curve. Look how much steeper that curve is. So we need to look at what other countries are doing and why are we so expensive. I put some, some information down why the U.S. system is so, so expensive and at the same time so relatively inefficient with, with respect to the results. So um, we need to learn something from that. Um, to know that though, or to, to, to learn in, in general, you sh should look at the health determinants in general. So what are the health determinants? 25% are social circumstances, socioeconomic factors. What is socioeconomic factor is on whether you have enough to eat, you have access to care, you're isolated, you have a, a good education, you have a, a decent income. And if you look at uh, just the numbers uh, between the 10% the, the of the richest and then 10% of the poorest, there's a 14 year difference in life expectation. So that has a huge effect. Second huge effect is your genetics. You can't select at the moment, you can't determine, that's just bad luck. Uh, but also we'll be able probably to do something about that. Obviously, individual behavior, how you eat, how you drink, uh, whether you use drugs, uh, you exercise a lot, uh, the way you live, uh, town, uh, urban setup, uh, um, uh, does it have uh, a good water, good air, uh, where do you live in, in the US, in Africa and Asia, and only 15% are healthcare provision. So sometimes you have to ask yourself, is, like, is it really worth to put all this money into healthcare changes? Should we not put it actually in the in the top parts? Um, discussion to be made, uh, something the politics should disturb. But for the time being, we talk about healthcare provision only. But I think that most of the other aspects are significantly more important. And you should, every one of us has a responsibility to uh, work on their individual behavior. And uh, also we as uh, the politics should work on on trying to improve uh, environment social uh, circumstances so um, where will healthcare be delivered in ten years and this is a question um, that you know everybody who is who is who's an active participant should ask himself or herself so it will go down to only be two percent by the doctor and ten percent by the hospital again remember what I said about the future it could also be different than that but I believe that that will happen a lot of things will happen at home uh, or everywhere else. 
but you will only go very infrequently to the healthcare, to the to the to the ambulatory or to the um, to the critical care. And you already see this, the uh, amount of virtual visits and the, like in COVID-19 now, the virtual visits will even go up and now is going down and has also a little bit to do with people don't want to uh, travel in when they can't travel. They don't want to be around sick people and other reasons. So that will go up. And if you look at the U.S. healthcare system, sorry, that always push a little bit on the U.S., but it's so uh, uh, intrinsically obviously that, you know, increase the number of people in the healthcare, but, you know, it, it dramatically inc decrease the time that healthcare people have to spend with their patients, dramatic increase in, in, in hospital costs and general costs. This is dramatic, and, and, and uh, I, I won't say that it's the biggest problem, but cost is certainly a, a problem that we need to address. So also an interesting chart. Look at this one, very positive, right? Very sarcastic, rude, hurried, rushed, arrogant. This is the definition of what the patient thinks about their physicians in two words. It's a very respected the journal that did that. And the reason for the rush busy is that there is maybe too much demand on them. The, the reason for arrogant is maybe that there is uh, too much rush. So, uh, you know, there is too much stress in the system. We need to take some of the stress out. And I believe technology can do that. So if you look at these things, you kind of like identify problems and you should try to address them. So um, one of the biggest problems that we have, however, in the healthcare, and I've mentioned this before already, is that uh, if you want to democratize it, change it, uh, alter workflow, make it a little bit more open, you have to fight a lot of barriers. And one of the main barriers is the paternalistic approach of doctors. They are there and they know they represent it. And, and please apologize for all the doctors on the call. Uh, I very much respect you. I think you're great people. But at the end of the day, you also have to respect that there's new things coming up and new things that will change your workflow. So already 200 years ago, um, it was identified that there is you know, everyone is different. There is not a same, uh, you cannot really do a general approach and try to hope to address everybody's concerns and everybody's diseases. It is, uh, it is a little bit like an art. Um, it, it, is, um, it is not something where you can use only statistics to determine what happens. You have to look at every individual case. And that's why we believe that healthcare uh, or sick care at the moment will need to change. It will need to be more precision and personal uh, oriented. It needs to actually be judged based on the value that it provides to a, to a patient or to a treatment. So what is the patient experience? What is the outcome? that the patient has and what is the associated cost with it. And it needs to be that the patient is not running around in the system uh, being juggled around, but the, the health setup needs to actually take care of the patient as the centric approach. So um, I, I put this in a, in a table uh, on the left, um, which I don't want to go in detail anymore, but I think future health delivery is something that we want to have. I want to have, I want to have minimal invasive treatments. I want that that I'm in the center of attention. I want to be that the healthcare system focuses on prevention and is value uh, uh, reimbursed and not just uh, procedure reimbursed. So all the things that I want and most people want to happen, and that's what we should work on. And we will have also a uh, significantly more empowered patient. I can recommend, by the way, Bertolt Mesco's uh, blog or website, The Medical Futurist. He's, he's a physician himself, and, and, and he, he is very technology-driven. And we will be able to do significantly more at home ourselves with the gadgets and the tools that we have. We'll have a communication with the doctor, and we'll have a completely different setup. And a lot of medical doctors then come again with this paternalistic, oh, please don't confuse your Google search with my medical degrees. That's very arrogant. And I think that will need to change. And uh, we'll need to also educate uh, physicians and every stakeholder in the, in the, in the system that uh, there is a different uh, uh, way of actually addressing healthcare concerns. So an empowered patient will be in the center of healthcare, I'm sure, and will need to be embraced by all the stakeholders. A lot more problems there are. Don't want to get into detail. You have some time to actually read while I talk. So there's a lot of people dying just because of medical errors. A lot of things are useless. A lot of things are not actually done, even though they would be necessary. Um, neglected diseases, you are, you, you are big shit. Sorry to say that because pharma is not interested in you. 
uh, there's not enough money to be made. Um, there's issues with fake medicine. Um, but on the other hand, there's also uh, solutions to that, which are listed on the right, at least some obvious solutions. So these are some of the issues that we need to address. So innovation, that's another definition, is identifying and then subsequently solving problems that matter. And um, problems that matter we can possibly solve um, in the upcoming future with exponential technology. So I, that's why I call it exponential health. And uh, the exponential curve is actually known to most of you. A lot of the, lot of the developments that uh, came are developed in the last 20, 30, 40 years. And there's a traumatic increase in technology advancement, what it really does. Um, the, the, the number of inventions that come out, at it's, 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 a, it's a significant, not only significant, it's an exponential uh, improvement. Um, there's lots of technologies out there that have come up in the, in, in the last uh, few years that are extremely relevant to healthcare, starting with AI, uh, robots, uh, uh, virtual augmented reality, health tech in general. There's pretty much all of these technologies out there can be used and can be converged to actually do something in the healthcare space. Reason for that is um, Moore's law that you know technology or the, 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 the calculation speed and the price performance is, is doubling just about every 18 to 24 months. That has even kept up. Um, uh, you know, I think it started in the 1950s, it has kept up till now. Now we may get to a limit because of physical, uh, uh, we, we can't make it any smaller, but then we have other technologies coming out, a quantum computer, we probably will take over. So um, these exponential technologies are typically governed by 6Ds, they, they have to be digital. Um, they typically initially go through a disappointment phase where technology is big, cumbersome, expensive, has some hope but it's still very disappointing. At some point in time, because it, it doubles and it improves the price performance uh, and the, 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 uh, the general capability every 18, 24 months, there's a disruption point where it actually is a very quickly uh, better than the current technology and it will subsequently replace this technology and the in incremental ideas. It will then lead to reducing the size, reducing the cost, so dematerializing, it will get cheaper because there's more volume out there, and then lead to democratization, so availability for everybody. This is the typical 6D process and you can think of what technologies are actually feasible and fitting in, 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 in that with respect to healthcare, with respect to um, being implemented in the future. I would think about robotics for sure, AI for sure, um, uh, uh, genetic, uh, synthetic uh, uh, biology, um, tissue engineering, all kinds of other things that uh, could uh, certainly be feeling, fitting into this uh, exponential and this 6D curve. So it's not just AI. I think I want to make that clear. AI is a very important topic, but AI needs to have sensors, otherwise it can't do anything. It needs to have also other devices uh, that work in conjunction with it. So we need to find, um, if we really want to go from healthcare uh, to health, we need to actually find a way to juggle around and change technology, converge it with new uh, education, uh, have partnering schemes work interdisciplinary and actually increase prevention and self-empowerment. So for that, we need to take um, medical needs, uh, healthcare needs together with technologies, convert them and create new um, new convergence technologies. And, and, and some of them mentioned already before, telemedicine, AI, radiology already um, already quite advanced, they are there. All the other ones are still works in progress, but we can imagine that it will come up and we'll do some great stuff in the, in the, in the near future. So remember that one? So I very much believe, in, and, and others too, that uh, digitization uh, will restore some humanity in medicine. We'll probably get, rid, hopefully get rid of this, uh, this chart on the right. Uh, where we have to deal with arrogant people uh, in, in the healthcare. I don't want to get rid of people, by the way. I just want people to use technology so they they are actually concentrating on the main things rather than actually um, uh, dealing with the issues that other technologies could much better solve. So the aim that we should work on, uh, on as entrepreneurs, innovators, uh, it has a credible fault. It's it's basically you know should improve the outcomes. Obviously, that's something we we don't want to go back. We don't want to have worse outcomes. It should 
but it should focus on, on uh, improved clinician and patient experience, and it should lower costs. I think lowering costs, I've mentioned that many times before, is a major aspect, major concern. If you really want to traumatically lower something, you have to start completely rethinking the process and you cannot continue with the incremental end uh, approaches. So I, I'm looking a little bit also at the cars, you know, we, we, are, we are making huge advances in, in, in uh, with the LiDAR technology in, in, in self-driving cars and cars teach cars. They're connected. It's a big network. And uh, the question is always, is also why can we not do that in the healthcare system? Why can we not set up the data transfer the data usage so we can all learn to improve uh, diagnosis and then subsequently the treatments. What we also need to do is we need to move from intensive care, community care, this very high tech care, to independent living, uh, you know, ambulatory care, not only because it's significantly cheaper, but also because it, it improves the quality of life. So uh, double fold, cheaper and better quality, but we need tools for that. And um, there will be, um, at least I'm sure about this, um, there will be a transition point, obviously, where you still need to go into professional care, but a lot of things need to be done at home. You, you can use your cell phone, you can use your, uh, some other devices you have at home that are all connected to each other, speak to each other, exchange data points, and give an evaluation of what your status is, and then we'll actually recommend to go to professional care. So there will be a lot of uh, future trends in there, but please don't forget that we also should develop something to make healthcare available and democratize it for developing countries. And we should think about the elderly care, we should think about personal care at home, and obviously about reducing cost. So you need to always, and that this in the US or in Germany, that we have different needs than, than in Africa, and you need to find um, your unmet clinical needs and you develop technology for that. There is no, oh, there is some tip global technologies, but there is a, a lot more regional technology that makes sense and that need to be found and that we, where you really need to identify that burning problem and create a painkiller for it. So um, this is just some examples I'll, I'll show you. This is the digital doctors back. Daniel Kraft already proposed this in, or showed that in 2017 in the exponential medicine. All these things are available. We need to just combine them now. We don't want to carry around all these uh, different types, but uh, it, it's obvious to most people who are in the development stage that you can't combine these things. Why shouldn't you? You know, you have one a computer system, you have a supercomputer in your pocket already anyway, and you have just different sensors or multi-sensors and combine this. Um, even the FDA has understood that there is a lot of digital health uh, devices out there that could be used, should be used to improve diagnosis and, uh, and therapy. But they also understood that they cannot go through a three or four or five year evaluation period in clinical trials. There needs to be something that allows these devices to get on the market quicker. Breathables are around, sweatables are around, Suckables are around, underwearables, you can already buy this kind of stuff. Um, uh, things where you check your food and check your, your diet habits. Uh, poopables, very important, uh, sounds kind of silly, but uh, you know, actually measuring your microbiome output, what is, your, what is the consistency and the, the, the amount and quality of your bacteria is very, very important. That we, there has been scientifically proven that there's a link between uh, mental capability uh, and uh, your your uh, output at the at the other end, fantech checking your babies, checking uh, uh, health setups, uh, you know, for the unborn or for the for the just born, working on education uh, using uh, augmented and virtual reality, working on truck delivery. I think a big issue, right? So uh, you know, you need to have a feedback loop of. Uh, for insulin patients, uh, clearly, like when is insulin needed? What kind of activities? You don't want to measure continuously. It should be a loop system. Um, also, electroceuticals where you use uh, electrical devices that are actually measuring other uh, parameters in your body and help you with with all kinds. Of, there's, a, there's a big list here, all kinds of problems that you have. Very minimal invasive, very small devices that uh, are digital that can be observed and monitored and um, you know, could significantly help uh, these problems. And I think this is the, the, the most exciting to me, at least 32,000 or 50,000 known diseases are caused by single point gene mutations. So if we will be able to not only analyze our genes, but also to actually do a gene therapy, fix them up, we could 
possibly fix 32 of these 50,000 before they actually occur, prevention. So this is just a little step of, of, of how that could be done and how it's already been done in research. And I'm sure that it actually will make its way into uh, normal uh, use um, in the next five, 10, 15 years. Um, AI, one more word on AI. Uh, I, I, I think AI is, is, is great, is, is, is amazing what you can do and what, what kind of information you can get. There's a little bit of a problem, however, um, which is the no charge part. We, simply don't necessarily completely know of how we uh, how the business models work I, I think that the the venture capitalists know a little more than we because they invest heavily in it but um, if we fix this then I think AI is, is gonna gonna have traumatic effects so um, there will be significantly more um, of these smart health devices, but ask yourself right now, which of these have you seen before and which of them have you seen at your physician? So maybe the physician is not well informed and which of those are available in prescription or do you have to actually buy them all by yourself? That would not be democratized healthcare. So even the big companies have now analyzed or understood that they need to create a loop uh, and they need to, you know, connect treatment with uh, uh, follow up with uh, prevention with healthy living and create the right tools for that that talk to each other. Siemens has introduced something called the digital twin, where you all collect these data points and you learn uh, across these disciplines uh, for uh, a better health outcome. And uh, hopefully, we can then combine all these mm -hmm. technologies, uh, converge them and uh, create uh, something that uh, you know, goes through the entire uh, disease ladder um, and will end up with prevention so you don't have the disease at the end of the day. There's a, a, a company in San Diego, Human Longevity, that already does some of that. It's an expensive process. Not everybody can afford it, certainly not a democratized way, but that's not their goal. Their goal is to gather data, use genetic information, clinical information, MRI information, converge this and actually try to come up with a personalized risk report. They're, they're very far, but I'm very happy they're doing this and that will probably help us in the future as well. As well. So exponential technologies, we have a certain horizon. We will uh, move from treating sick to preventing. I will have value-based, person-centric, personalized healthcare. And we should do this with development goals that are different maybe than right now. They should be effective, they should be cheap, they should be easy to use, small footprint, uh, intelligent. And if you really look at existing technologies, existing workflows, you can actually analyze how they're doing things with maybe expensive devices and try to actually, you know, make it simple and easier. I, I have done this several times and there's great outcomes. So it's not only completely looking new, look at existing things and try to actually improve the workflow. And it also needs to have an, uh, an, an effect on education. Clinical education needs to include um, technologies and engineering uh, education needs to include soft skills, empathy, um, project solving, curiosity, and we need to create thought leaders and entrepreneurs that actually deal with these issues. So um, uh, the, the soft skills, I think, uh, get more and more important. So I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's very critical that we deal not only about technology, about treating patients, but we need to actually uh, also focus more than we did before on these issues here. So uh, this will also come uh, if we have a shift from home care to prevention uh, versus right now, it will come with a changed business model. What has to change? If you really uh, I, I believe uh, that the current healthcare model will continue, I don't think so. So what has to change? And uh, while I believe that home care is cool, prevention is cool, we need to also integrate that in the current workflow. We need to integrate it in the reimbursement system. And we need to actually uh, talk to the politicians to uh, give us reimbursement for that. So a little bit the flow that I, that I drew up based on the presentation before. Technologies will cause a paradigm shift. We'll actually need to think more disruptive. Uh, cost is a very important issue uh, and you know considering the future trends we will lead to an empower patient to new, te new technologies and there's lots of other healthcare problems that we need to discuss and maybe you will ask later on but they need to be issued but all of them provide international uh, huge international innovation opportunities so take care and take them there's lots to do so as a summary technology and the developments will change very fast 
significantly faster than you can imagine. So uh, Peter Diamandis and Ray Korshaw said there's more change in the next 20 years than there was in the last 20 years. We'll have a, a move to home care prevention, tailor services, and there's all entrepreneurial activities in, in needed and included. Uh, so there's massive opportunities um, uh, to be uh, a disruptive, uh, not only in the healthcare itself, but also around well-being diet. And uh, also think about the uh, developed world. I think it's very important to me that we not only thinking about our uh, but our well-being. That of course we need to do that, but we also try to do something good for the rest of the world. And there's huge reverse innovation opportunities in this one. So think exponential. And while I say this with Think Exponential, I'm a member of this open exponential platform, which actually tries to uh, not tries to, but uh, you know gives this exponential technologies in combination with a, 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 a exponential organization formula where you use external and internal parameters to create new business model which fit that well. So I, I, I recommend you actually look into this and, and there's actually a, a, some tests and some, some training you can do for free. So it's really cool and you get some, uh, some mindset into that. So for, for the time being, I would advise you to sleep more, meditate more, see family more, move more, learn more, eat better. It's, all the things you can do even in isolation or in quarantine, which I am in at the moment. Uh, you can't do anything about your ancestors, unfortunately. Um, and we need to make sure that we stay alive for the next 15, 20 years to actually um, uh, see all these healthcare developments, um, be active in future developments and hope that we don't have crazy politicians destroy uh, this uh, future hope. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm available.